Hello everyone, uh, my name's Gareth um, and I'm going to be talking to you about, I've realised the name on the slide is actually a bit different. Uh, the name I gave the talk was Open Air, to, uh, no, Open Science, Open, o to, open Air to Open Science, thank you Rachel. Um, and then I forgot to put it on this one, it's far better now. But anyway, so this, uh, I'm going to be talking about um, a platform, greenhouse gas data analysis. Um, I'm from the University of Bristol um, and I'll just go over contents pages aren't quite as common anymore but anyway um, so problems um, so the problems we encountered like what problems there are in maybe like atmospheric chemistry research um, talking about what open GHG is um, the cloud technology we've been using um, covering like how we would use service functions um, and what we use them for um, creating user interface um, so yeah different user interfaces we've made for um, interacting with a different sort of functionality of open GHG um, building tutorials and then how to, well, hopefully, build a community around the project, which is, of course, a work in progress. Um, so problems, that there are lots and lots of measurements, so like lots of different gases, an awful lot of data. Um, there's lots of different sensor networks around the world, so like DEC, GAGE, NOAA, um, bringing in lots of data in different formats. Um, the data is stored in lots of different places, such as, you know, server on a lab somewhere or a workstation somewhere, um, and it's probably just looked after by you know one researcher that then sort of doles it out um, and can it be shared um, what kind of license do you want to give it um, and you know how can you cite it if you use it um, some I don't know if embargo is quite the right term but you know it's sort of held back for quality checks and make sure all the calibration and everything's correct um, so sometimes people want to sit on data for a little while and make sure it's all correct before sort of sending it out to other people um, so yeah these are just some issues um, and then this is quite a nice video made by my boss, uh, Matt Rigby, um, and it's just like methane emissions um, around the world um, from, yeah, lots of different sources. So what's OpenGHG? So it's a platform for greenhouse gas data analysis. Uh, um, it's for data providers to share their data, um, researchers to form like analyses on data, um, so different workflows they'd use, um, probably using Jupyter Notebooks. Um, retrieving public available information from different um, sources, such as the ICOS Carbon Portal. Um, and to NOAA, they um, put out this big pack of data called the NOAA Ops Pack. Um, controlling access to data, so say if maybe someone wants to give specific people access to data. We're also hoping, also hoping at some point to um, allow people to run simulations, um, maybe on sort of a cluster in the cloud sort of instance, or like HPC, maybe. Um, it's not for being a big data archive like CEDA. We don't want to be you know, hosting petabytes because it's really expensive. Um, and so this is a map of the DEC network. So this is a tall tower network um, across the UK. Um, but there's, you know, we get sensor data in from um, lots of different sources, North America, South Korea, lots, you know, and it's often in lots of different formats. So, you know, just CSVs, text files, lots of different headers. Um, so you need quite customized, you know, you know, parsing functions to process all the data. Um, and as I said, it's often stored on local computers, so like, at, you know, on a server in a lab. Um, and I don't know if Dropbox is still going, but yeah, Dropbox, um, this is what came to my mind when sharing data, maybe Google Drive or something these days. Um, yeah, and so cloud technologies and everything is obviously solved by moving to the cloud. Um, yeah, you know, but yeah, in this case, we hopefully it will be. Um, and we wanted quite a nice, simple interface, um, something we could, people are familiar with. So we chose Jupyter Notebooks. I know not everyone's a big fan of Jupyter Notebooks, but I think within like data analysis and just performing little analyses on data, they are pretty, well, they're really good. Um, Wants people to interact from a laptop or a desktop, like you know, you don't need a junky workstation or access to HPC or anything to use the platform. Um, and then we want to pump off some computation to Oracle. So that's you know, we use those guys to um, perform data processing and stuff in the cloud. Um, and we chose FN, it's got a cool logo, um, for the serverless functionality. Um, and then we set up to Hub. We're using Kubernetes, which is sometimes painful. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so everyone, yeah, a diagram. So we got users, and so we set up a Jupyter Hub instance, Jupyter Kubernetes uh, on the Oracle Cloud, and this is quite nice to set up. They've just used their o OKE um, setup. You get a nice Kubernetes cluster. That's really easy. Just use um, zero, zero to Jupyter Hub with Kubernetes, and that's a good set of scripts that will get you set up real quick. Um, and then I'm not really sure what logo to use for serverless functions. When I was looking, there wasn't really a good one, so I've just used the Lambda. And so I know it's not, this isn't AWS Lambda, obviously, but it, it was the easiest thing I could do. Um, and so we're using FN behind the scenes. It's quite nice. It's quite easy to set up. 
um, and then FN spins up a doc container containing your, you know, your function and does all the, the computation behind the scenes. Um, and then we're also using the Oracle Object Store, um, which is just a nice, simple way of storing quite a lot of data um, and in you know, the kind of format you want. And then, yeah, I, the Oracle Cloud, and then it's just sitting on the magic that is cloud. You know, those guys must work hard. Um, so why FN? So I think the tagline for FN is it's open source, container native, uh, and serverless. But well, serverless platform. Um, yeah, and it's nice to set up. You can set up hub locally on your own on your computer. Um, if you're running Linux or Mac OS, I'm not sure it works on Windows. Um, yeah, and you can just allow people to move between clouds. So you know, you're not tied into using Oracle. You have you know, Oracle functions, I think they're called. Um, so you, you just, if you want, you can just spin up a VM and just start playing around quite quickly and easily. Um, there's pretty, pretty well supported. They're still developing it. They're still you know, bit getting updates and stuff. Um, and say if our, when our Oracle money does run out, I mean, we need to move to Jasmine, say, um, we can hopefully just move it. And then until we sort of access their service offering, um, we can just, yeah, move over. Um, so yeah, this is what a call process looks like. Just a HTTP post request to FN, spins up a container, and then Python. Um, so yeah, this is anatomy. I got a bit carried away with um, animations here. But so the anatomy of a, a function call. So we've got data provider wants to give us some data. Um, can upload it to our GPTOB instance currently. Um, we use message pack to package the binary data and say like a dictionary of metadata and associated things um, all together. Um, use requests, requests have a cool logo. Um, and yeah, post that to the magic of the internet. That's all you got to be carried away. Um, the, and then FN spins up, starts the serverless function up. And we do some data processing. Um, so most of it's done with pandas, as probably most, you know, you know, like data wrangling is. And um, then we convert that into an X-ray data set, which is commonly used in the atmospheric um, chemistry community, and probably in quite a few others. It's a nice format. Um, and we make sure all the attributes and everything are recorded um, with that NetCDF file. Um, NetCDF, into the object store. There's always buckets involved. Um, and we get loads of storage metadata, so we get, you know, save the keys and everything where the data is stored at, um, and then we can pass that back through FN and then back to the data provider who can, you know, depending on how interested they are, they can look at that. So, so this is a slide that I wasn't too sure about, but some modules. So we wanted to kind of make OpenGHD nice and easy to use, and so you don't have to go digging through, you know, once you've used it a few times, you should be able to go back and kind of, you know, understand where function should be and you know not have to go digging through the docs all the time. Um, so we've got some different submodules. So we've got standardization. Um, I won't go into too much detail about these. Um, like storing. So this is like storing of the data and the metadata um, and the object store. Um, object storage. So at the moment we're using the Oracle Cloud um, interface. Um, yeah, nice Python library that does all all of that. Um, but say if we did want to move it to a different cloud provider, we just sort of abstract away that you know, some of the function calls, so we can all use it, also use it on a local disk. Um, yeah, so say if you want to just play around with OpenGHG, you can download it and use a sort of a play object store on your local drive, which is just files and folders. Um, so yeah, you can have a bit of play. It won't be as, you know, fully featured, but most of the things will work. Um, and it's also quite handy for development. development. Um, cloud, which handles all the calls to the functions and packages all the data. Um, analyze. Um, which my colleague Rachel's been working a lot on. Um, so this is commonly used workflows. Um, so combining like um, like time series data, modeling data, footprints, all that type of thing. Um, transform, again, this is for like um, transforming data, um, adding some caching ability. Um, so you know if you want to do some, you know, changing of data, you don't have to like, redo it all the time. Um, plotting, so just creating some handy, hopefully handy, um, plotting functions. Um, yeah, just to make plotting a bit simpler, so you don't have to remember, I don't know, maybe your matplotlib. Um, it's a lovely interface. Um, so the whole thing's typed. This maybe isn't that interesting, but yeah, so it's all typed with MyPy, um, and it's a fickle bee sometimes. So we have some custom types, and we, it's actually quite handy. You know, we found quite a few what would have been bugs um, using MyPy, um, and util, which is just handling timestamps and things behind the scenes. Um, yeah, so now I'll move on to user interface. So as I said, I wanted some nice and familiar. Um, so we picked Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and you know, a lot of people are pretty um, familiar with them. 
Um, yeah, so we started the Jupyter Hub and used the Jupyter Lab interface, um, which is, yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, and it comes with the tools people should need, like Pandas, X-Ray, Dask, Matplotlib, Plotly, and stuff. Um, and of course, if you find people need um, others, we can always install them. Uh, excuse me. Um, and it's really good for tutorials, like notebooks can be verted to HTML. If you can look at the docs open .org, um, yeah, you can see that there's quite a few tutorials there that have been just converted from notebook into HTML. Um, yeah, so low barrier entry, and you can also have other kernels. So there's, there's maybe one of the data providers wants to possibly use R, because you know some really nice plotting functionality within R. So yeah, if we could pull some data and give them some data, um, and then use is it ggplot2 to do some plotting. Um, so yeah, my boss, Christopher Woods, probably, I think he gave a talk this morning about tutorial-driven development. So this is something that's quite nice. Like, I don't, you know, probably don't do it absolutely correctly properly um, because, you know, you write a function and then you write tutorial, then you realize the function is book to use or, you know, just you have to jump through some hoops. Um, so yeah, it's quite a nice way of, you know, getting a workflow together. Um, and yeah, Notebook, Stupitex is quite good for converting to Markdown and stuff. MV Sphinx, Sphinx. Um, and yeah, once you've got a setup, really, it's quite all right to use. Um, and again, that's at the docs, .org, and that's updated um, whenever CI pipelines run and all the tests pass and everything. Um, we make sure that all the tutorial notebooks and things are run. Um, so, because it's quite easy when you change things and you know, you're sort of developing quite iteratively, say, um, for tutorials to get out of date. So, yeah, we run those and we get a failure on one stage of our CI um, if the notebooks fail. Um, and yeah, we think that users should be able to get started um, within minutes um, of you know getting up on the hub uh, and running through some of the tutorials. Um, so this is just a quick overlook of you um, of one of the tutorial notebooks. Um, so you know you might recognise the notebook interface. And then we're here. We're just going to pull some data down from the Icos Carbon portal. Um, so we're just going to use the this retrieve atmospheric function. Um, and this goes away. It'll take a few moments because we're pulling data down from the Icos servers. Um, and what we get back is an obs data class. Um, so this is just a data class. Um, and it's got some methods on it, and it, you know, it pulls down all the metadata associated. So I could provide quite a lot of data um, on metadata. Um, so here we just, there's an extra data set um, that actually looks quite nice within a Jupyter notebook. Um, so you can have a look at that. You can check the attributes and all the data variables and coordinates and stuff. Um, and we can also look at the metadata. So the metadata is just a dictionary of metadata. So everything you should need, um, the lat long of the station, heights, the conventions, um, citation string, um, that type of thing. Um, and you can, yeah, check the instrument that's used. So this is quite important within within the field. Maybe not, yeah, as interesting to you guys, but um, we can also just do like a little plot, do a time series plot, um, and yeah, have a quick look. So plot is quite nice. It makes quite nice, you know, interactive plots. Um, you can highlight and, you know, you probably get the gist. Um, yeah, so we then, I think with lots of projects probably, you know, you think sort of creating a Python data analysis platform, um, and then one day it was exciting because COP was on uh, and we needed to make like a data dashboard. Um, so I just created a quick, I had a little bit of um, experience using React, um, which is, you know, quite a nice, quite well, pretty nice um, JavaScript library um, framework. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just created like a little time series plots on it um, and using leaflet for mapping. Um, so yeah, we scraped data from different um, different networks, so Beacon, um, uh, AQ Mesh, um, and uh, a data provider um, within the ACLG in Bristol um, had a, an instrument up in um, Loch Lomond. Um, yeah, so that's all sorted on GitHub. It's all publicly available, dashboards available, and all data was made um, public CC by four. Um, again, this is just a little um, overview of the dashboard. So yeah, this is just all automated, so it just updates the data um, overnight, um, pulls the data down, and this is for one of the sites that wasn't quite up to date. And again, it's just like, you know, a nice plotly graph um, covering, yeah, some different measurements. Um, yeah. So I'd also like to talk about OLS5 because I was going to talk about like community. Um, so I took part in OLS5, and if, you, and if you've heard about it, it's not just for life sciences, and, um, the Mitsubishi and the number, but yeah, this is really good. Um, if people would like to sort of get involved with, you know, more open science and open data um, and more thinking about that, um, it's really nice for any sessions. 
um, and help me think about building like accessible video and text tutorials. So doing things like transcribing um, YouTube video tutorials, that type of thing, um, to make them more accessible. Also adding like contribution guidelines, um, issue templates to make things a bit less scary, um, and making like um, pull request templates. So if you want to make a pull request, you can just yeah, you can fill out a bit more of a template, and you yeah. That's what you expect. I also started open GHG Gitter channel, but as you, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit quiet. Um, but you can check out um, openlifestyle.org. Um, and I'm not sure when OS6 is starting, um, but yeah, that's, I, I can highly recommend it. Um, yeah, and so a community will hopefully build a community of different researchers. Uh, yeah, build something useful, people use it. Um, so we've got guinea pigs in the ACRG, um, PhD students that. Um, we had a session a while ago, actually, um, which was really good, getting like workflows that people use and getting them to use OpenGHG um, and move, see, you know, how they could move away from using their, you know, sort of current sort of academic code base, um, and build plugin functionalities. So people can, you know, add things to the platform more easily. Um, and thinking about non-Python users, so like R users and things. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Rachel here, uh, Matt Rigby, Christopher Woods, the RSC team at Bristol, um, and the ACRG, the Atmospheric Chemistry Research Group. Um, yeah, so, and also NERC, uh, and the guys at ICOS, um, we had some good talks with. Um, and yeah, you can check out our OpenGHG organization on GitHub, um, give.com slash OpenGHG, and pretty much everything's under the Apache license, version two. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, does OpenGHD have a metadata catalog? If so, how do you browse it, and is it updated automatically? When it yes, yeah, yeah. So we just store um, all the metadata um, in a little JSON. It's called TinyDB. Um, just quite a nice way of storing metadata. So whenever we upload some data, we create like a UID um, for that set of data, um, and all metadata is stored um, within the metadata database. So if when you want to request the data again, we just search through that little database and make a request and pull out the data from the object store. Um, yeah, so everything's updated um, when people upload the source. I think one of the problems with metadata is you need to make sure people provide enough metadata. So when data providers upload data, you need to make sure that they have actually you know, selected the right, or best be passing the right arguments, um, because it's quite easy to, um, yeah, things get mixed up if there isn't enough, you know, like uniquely identifying information. Um, Use React to make GitHub pages, static site, use dynamic-ish data for the COP dashboard. Yeah, so we have just hosted that on um, GitHub pages um, and just use React to pull down. So when the data is passed and pulled down from um, the different sites, that then is then committed to um, a GitHub um, repo. And then when you load the dashboard, it, you just pull the data down from that GitHub repo. Um, yeah, so that seems to work quite nicely. Um, and it's quite an easy way of just using GitHub for everything, really, we don't have to store it anywhere. Um, it just, I've just got automated script that makes a commit to a repo. Um, yeah, and that, that worked. Um, I didn't think about combining them, but yeah, separate anyway. Um, okay, uh, where does the OpenGHG code run? Is it all client based or is there a server and client component? Yeah, so there's the cloud functions and they do, you know, most of the processing standardization. Um, so you can run it locally if you want to. Um, you, it does detection using environment variables to check whether you're running on the hub or locally. Um, and if you're on the hub, it sends passes all the data off to the service functions, and then it does all the storage of things in the cloud uh, object store. Um, but otherwise, there's just you know some functions that run on the hub that they make, you know, that handle all the calls and things to the object store. So yeah, it's all detected a bit based on the environment, really. Uh, is access to data from all sources automated? Uh, no, it's not automated. Um, that's the thing, that, you know, the data providers often want to go through the data and um, handle, you know, or, you know, check some of the data before they upload it. Um, now, things like pulling data from the ICOS Carbon Portal um, and no ops pack, that's quite easy to do, and that's automated in the sense that when people make the request and we'll cache it for a short amount of time. Um, but no, we don't really have any like automated scraping of the data or you know, bringing the data in from the sensors themselves because um, as I said, yeah, there's often lots of sort of intermediary steps before they get 
made public. Oh, how can I try this out on the cloud? Um, yeah, so at the moment, we just have a JupyterHub instance, um, and you can log into it using um, like one of the authorized um, GitHub usernames. Um, so we're hoping to open up more um, and create, you know, like a actual proper registration page and things. Um, but if you email me um, or contact me, I don't put my details. Um, well, come and talk to me, I guess. Yeah, um, and then I should have put up the registration link, but it's probably still in the stages where we want sort of feedback from maybe people in, in the field. Um, but yeah, come and talk to me, and yeah, give me a use, get a username, and if you want to have a go.